Hello, I'm Graham and I hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome to today's video, which is number five in a series of new videos I'm producing for users of the Panasonic Lumix SZ80 or 82 camera. Now, previously in this video series, we looked at the stills mode of the camera, and today I want to start looking at shooting video with the camera. Now, shooting video with this camera, I feel, is one of the strengths that this camera has to offer. It does have a limitation in the fact that you can't use external audio for your videos, but there are ways around that and we'll be discussing that later in the video. But today I want to talk about how to set up for video, what you might need in terms of ancillary equipment to enable you to get better video, and more importantly, how to use the camera in video mode. Now when we talk about shooting video with this particular camera, we're talking about either shooting 4K video or 1080p. Gone are the VGA resolutions that uh, previously appeared on some of the Panasonic cameras, so we're talking about high definition video. Well, ideally with this camera, you ought to be shooting in 4K, even if you are only going to be using it as a 1080p source for your video project. With 4K, you've got four times the amount of resolution, so that means you can actually crop into that scene and get a better shot. I'll demonstrate 4K versus 1080p later in the video, and you can see the amount of resolution you've got in 4K compared to shooting in 1080p. Now, when we're talking about recording, we ought to talk about recording quality. If you're recording in 1080p, you've got two choices. One is AVC HD and the other is MP4. Now, MP4 is a less compressed format than AVC HD, so you'll be able to edit that on lower spec PCs. But AVC HD is a compressed format. It needs to be decompressed for you to be able to edit it. So if you've got an older PC, AVC HD might cause you some uh, problems. And in fact, until a couple of years ago, AVC HD wasn't supported on Macintosh computers, but it is uh, fully supported uh, with the latest editions. So I would recommend you use MP4. It is the format that we have only to choose when we're choosing 4K video. So MP4 has a higher bit rate, and the bit rate determines the amount of detail that we're recorded in the scene. Now, when we're recording in 4K, there's so much data that has to be taken from the sensor, has to be compressed, and then written down to the memory card, that there is a lot of processing to be done by the camera itself. And that's why the camera does tend to get warm. The processor is really working hard to compress all that data and stream it onto your uh, SD card. Now, talking about SD cards, if we're recording in 1080p, then an ordinary class 10 card or even a class 6 card will suffice for your video recording as the bitrate is only 28 megabits a second and that will be easily uh, accommodated by a class 6 uh, SD card. Now when we record 4K with this camera we need to be looking at the bitrate which is 100 megabits per second. If you divide that by 8 that gives you 12 megabytes per second and that's the speed of card that you must use in order to uh, retain the right capacity without the camera stopping because the buffer has filled. If you use a class 6 card you'll find that after about 8 seconds the camera will shut down warning you that it's it stopped because of the recording rate of this card. So you need to be using a SD card with at least a U1 rating. I've been using the micro SD cards and converters and they are class U1 and I haven't had any problems recording 4K video either with this camera or with the FZ2500 that I'm recording with at the moment. So having established we're using 4K as a uh, quality and we've got the right capacity and right speed of memory card, we can start to talk about recording video. Well, you can see I've got the FZ82 set up on quite a substantial tripod. Now, this is one I would normally use for video. It's quite a heavy tripod, so it's not one that you're going to be carrying around on hiking trips. But if you're going to set up for doing a studio production or you've got an event to shoot, then a nice strong tripod is great. You don't get any shape from the tripod. Again, I fitted this with the Manfrotto HDV701 head, which is a fluid head, which allows me to get nice smooth pans and tilts if I need that in my video production. I do recommend you do use a tripod because if you use this camera handheld, especially if you're using it for long zoom, you'll get what's called jello and that's because of the way the shutter or the electronic shutter scans the sensor. If you're moving the camera while the frame rate is, is moving up, you'll find that you're getting this wobbly effect in the video and I can demonstrate that in a few moments if I handhold this camera. So it's better if you can get your camera on a sturdy tripod. Failing that, a, a monopod. Uh, these are quite cheap these days. Uh, this one has got 
uh, fold down feet so it gives me that extra stability point if I wanted to but it does stop the camera from moving up and down you've still got the side to side or front to back operation um, but that's not as severe as trying to hand hold the camera uh, while you're trying to film failing all that if you've got a small portable tripod screw that onto the bottom of the camera and hold the tripod to stabilize the camera a little bit more and again if you can use the electronic viewfinder and use the camera held against your eye again you've got that three points of suspension you're going to get a much stable video than trying to hold it looking at the LCD on the back of the camera so those are some handling tips uh, to try and get you some more stable video now there are two ways to start recording video one is by pressing the red record button and that puts you into a programmed auto mode for recording video and the other is by turning the top control dial until you align the uh, creative video icon against the white index mark on the flash housing and that's the mode which is the most suitable for getting better results with this camera so I've turned on the camera I'm turning the top control dial until I see the M aligned with the white index mark and on the back of the LCD you'll see the M for uh, movie mode now the exposure mode you've got the choice of four you've got program you've got aperture priority shutter priority and the fully manual mode now the choice of recording mode will depend upon your scene type. If you're in a static situation, a studio for example, or somewhere where the lighting isn't going to change, then you can use the manual mode because you can set the aperture, you can set the shutter speed and you can set the ISO to give you the correct exposure, just the same as you would if you're shooting a still shot. If you've got a scene which is actually going to be changing lighting, or if the lighting is going to change, if the sun's going to come out from behind clouds, then you need to use a mode which will respond to those changes. If you leave that in the manual mode, as that lighting changes, so your, your uh, image will change brightness all the time. So it's better to find a mode which will suit your scene type. And again, if you're going to be shooting where well, you're going to be uh, uh, using a pan or a tilt, and the lighting is going to be changing because you're going to see more of the sky or less of the sky if you're in one of the program auto modes the lighting will change and the actual image content will change on your video so it's better to lock that down in a manual mode so you don't change I'm going to demonstrate that right now so first of all I'm going to set the camera to the creative video mode by aligning the um, M and the camera icon across from the white index mark on the uh, flash housing that will be mimicked by the fact that I've got the camera icon and the M on the LCD screen. I'm going to select the M exposure on the back of the screen. With the manual exposure, you've got the three elements of the exposure triangle to set up. So we've got aperture, which will govern the amount of depth of field in the image. We've got the shutter speed, which will set the amount of subject motion blur, just as it would for still photography. And then we've got the ISO to set the camera sensitivity. Now, when shooting video, there's a rule that says you should use a shutter speed which is twice the frame rate. So with this particular camera, the frame rate here on a PAL-based system is 25 frames per second. So I should use a shutter speed which is 1 50th of a second. If you're using this with an NTSC-based camera where you've got 30 frames per second, then you'll be using a shutter speed of about a 60th of a second. So that's what I'm going to set in first. So I'm going to go into the uh, exposure. I'm going to press in the back control dial which changes the uh, operation between the shutter speed and the aperture and I'm going to dial in one fiftieth of a second. I've also got my ISO set to ISO 80 which as in stills gives you the best image quality. Looking at that my LCD exposure meter is telling me that I'm slightly overexposed so I'm going to click the back control dial and change the aperture until the exposure meter is showing the zero centre position and that's giving me an aperture of f8 so I've got a fifth of a second f8 with ISO um, 80 now if I start recording it means I can pan down and I can pan up take it into the sky and the exposure doesn't change so if I change any of the scene content you'll notice that none of that scene content brightness is changing. In contrast, if I stop the manual exposure and I went into the program auto mode, right now the camera is determining the exposure for me. Um, it's let me lock down an ISO, so my ISO is still um, ISO 80. My 
aperture and shutter speed are not displayed because the camera is controlling that for me. So if I start recording, as we did before, if I pan down, you notice the scene goes slightly brighter. And if I pan, pan up, you notice the foreground is going darker, the, the clouds are going darker because the camera is doing what it's expected to do and keep the exposure to give me that 18% neutral grey as you would in the stills picture. So it's changing the scene brightness. Now that could be a disturbing factor in your video. You always want to have the same exposure. So if you've got a scene type that's going to change brightness, it's better if you can lock the camera down by using the manual setup. In that last manual video sequence we shot, we know we had a fixed ISO of 80. My shutter speed, which was twice the frame rate, which was 1 50th, and the aperture at that point was f8. Now, if I wanted to use the aperture wide open, I wanted to use f2.8, I would need to limit the amount of light entering the lens by the use of a neutral density filter. I don't want to change the shutter speed because that would give me a staccato effect on the video, so we change the amount of light entering the camera. Now I've got two types here, one is a fixed neutral density filter, in this particular case it's ND4 which gives me effectively two stops reduction in light and this one is a variable, ends, variable ND filter which is ND2 to ND400 so one stop up to about six stops worth of light reduction uh, in this particular filter. The cheaper filters tend to give you colour cast, so it's better if you can spend a little bit more money and get a good quality filter. Now if I wanted to go from f8 to an f2.8, that's three whole stops, I would need to use an ND8 filter, which is a three stop light reduction. This one is the ND4, which would give me two stops, so I expect if the lighting hasn't changed, and it's still showing me f8, I can go down now to um, f4 which is a two-stop reduction. Unfortunately, I haven't got the right adapter to fit the lens and it would need a 55 to 72 millimeter step-up ring, but unfortunately I left that on my desk before I left this morning. So I'm just gonna hold that in position and hopefully um, I can keep my fingers out of the way so we can actually record the scene. Now, as you'd expect, the view on the LCD has gone quite dark. So I'm now gonna open up the aperture, gone from F8 to F5.6 down to f4 and that's the same exposure so i'm going to start recording and again because we're in the manual uh, recording mode as i change the position of the camera from foreground to include the sky you notice there's no change in the scene brightness as the camera doesn't try to compensate as it would in the program auto mode or if you use an aperture or shutter priority if i remove the filter Obviously the scene goes brighter, and if I change the aperture back now to f8, where it was, you'll notice we've got the scene same brightness as we had with the filter at f4. As with the stills mode, if you've got the camera set up on a tripod, turn off the image stabilisation. As if you're trying to do pans with this particular camera, the image stabilisation will try to uh, counteract the fact that you're doing a pan and you'll get some quite jerky movement. So turn off image stabilisation. So the fact we've got image stabilisation turned off in the camera, it means I can now do nice smooth pans using this fluid head. And they're not uh, interrupted by the camera trying to arrest any motion because it thinks the camera's moving. So you can get nice smooth pans with the particular head. And again, you can use it in the uh, tilt mode. The beauty of this particular lens is the fact that we can get something like 1500 millimeters effective focal length when we're shooting in video because of the way the 4K crop works. So at the moment I'm working in the 22 millimeter position. I'm going to zoom in now to what's called the Pigeon Tower, which is about half a mile away on the Rivington Moor there. So I'm just going to zoom in. Um, we're actually recording at the moment, so I'm going to zoom in. The lens isn't par focal, so it will not stay in focus while we actually zoom. I'm going to manually refocus.
Now you notice during that zoom the image went out of focus and that's because this particular lens isn't what's called par focal. It doesn't hold the focus as you zoom in and out. I've also got the camera set to autofocus single which means that I've set the focus point before I started recording. When it reached the final zoom point that I wanted, I had to refocus the camera by pressing the shutter button halfway down to get the camera to refocus. If I set the camera up for continuous autofocus in the setup menu, then when the camera stops zooming, the camera will actually do that for me. So I'm going to zoom back out to the 22mm position. After stop recording, while well, I just go into the mem menu and I'm going to set autofocus continuous autofocus to on. And again I'll start recording again and now I'll zoom again back into that uh, pigeon tower. And the camera will then autofocus for me as it's seeing that as the highest contrast in the scene and will set the uh, focus point for me. Notice before when I was in autofocus single, I had to half depress the shutter button to get the camera to refocus. Well, that just about covers all I wanted to cover outdoors. We're going to move indoors where I can continue the uh, explanation about using the right shutter speed relative to the frame rate, use of ND filters, setting white balance and the use of additional lighting to bring your video standard up to a more acceptable level if you're struggling to get good video quality. So let's move indoors and finish the video there.